So uh, back to this trenches, who am I and why am I presenting? I've been presenting at SharkFest for quite, actually since the very first one back in Foothills Community College. Um, I can't remember how many years that's been. And uh, I presented at just about every one except for one or two uh, recent SharkFest. And I've been doing packet analysis for quite a number of years. I think 19, uh, mid eighties maybe. So there was no such thing as a sniffer at the time. Um, so that's, I kind of predate sniffer. I think it's all like that so long ago. Uh, but anyway, so I've been doing this a lot. It was a fascination of mine and I was hooked when I was taking my computer science course and I was writing a network operating system. That was my senior project and it was cool. But then when I actually got a chance to see what I wrote in software flying around a virtual network, I was hooked. I, I, and then I went all in on packet analysis um, and it takes practice. So this is um, the unfortunate thing about packet analysis and being good at protocol analysis is that you have to practice. There's just no way around it, okay? This is not one of those things that you sit back and, and you can understand everything that I'm saying, but it won't matter until you actually try it for yourself, okay? Because then you'll get to that point, you go, what the hell did he say? Like, I don't know what this means. And so it's repetition, 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 uh, just like that book uh, says about 10,000 hours, right? 10,000 hours, you can become an expert. I don't think that's an overreach. I think 10,000 hours seems about right. So let's talk about um, who I am again. Uh, I'm not on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. My life is much better since I've gotten off all those things. I am on LinkedIn. So you can Google for me on LinkedIn. And then that uh, last line there, which is uh, my YouTube channel. If you go there, you'll see some, uh, probably some flight sim, virtual reality stuff, some woodworking stuff, playlist. But the one that you want is um, Shark Fest. There's one for Shark Fest. There's one called Hansang's book, I think. It might be webinar or book. Uh, and those are all, or TCP protocol analysis for TCP. You'll figure it out. When you see the playlist, it'll be obvious. Um, and so you can find some of the older sessions, uh, other uh, sessions about TCP IP and protocol analysis that I've done in the past there as well. Okay. And, uh, oh, and I forgot, um, I work for Netscope. So I'm the field CTO for Netscope and um, security company, cloud security company, cloud security broker and whatnot. And so that's how you can find me. All right. So um, before I get started, this is important. So a couple of quotes that kind of goes in line with the session. And that is, this is the first quote I love. And uh, experience is what you get right after having needed it. So if you think about that, um, you may have been in a troubleshooting scenario where you're scratching your head, you're not quite solving it. And then you learn something. And if you look back, you go, ah, damn, I would have solved that like in 30 seconds flat. Okay. I cannot tell you how many times that's happened in my career where I learned something and then just the previous project or troubleshooting would have been so much easier. Okay. And so who said this? Well, the first person I heard say it was Jasper during one of his sessions. And I, uh, I had a tattooed up. No, I didn't have it tattooed on my butt. I uh, memorized it because it's such a ap apropos quote. Okay. Experience is what you get right after having needed it the most. Uh, again, goes back to you need to practice, you need to practice, you need to practice. The other quote, I love this one too. It, um, it sort of kind of goes along with the first quote. Um, you can read it there. Good decision comes from experience. Again, signifying how important experience is, but you can't get experience without screwing things up, right? That's kind of the best uh, school of hard knocks is the idiom that we use in the US. So and I believe this, uh, and this was Mark Twain, I believe this to be true too, um, because a couple of Shark Fest sessions ago, I, I, I told people that, you know, I brought down an entire branch because it was a rookie mistake and I created a layer two loop. I should have checked. I assumed certain things weren't in order and I, I didn't check. I got lazy and I brought down the entire branch. Now, you know, stuff like that happens. What made this particularly painful was I assured 
the branch manager that this is the safest thing you can do from a network change perspective. And when she asked me, hey, um, is this going to be okay? Because it's still market hours. And I had the, <laughs> this is why it's seared in my brain. I actually laughed. I LOL. I went, ha. Huh. I said, trust me, this is spanning a port is the safest thing you can do. It's the most non-destructive thing you can do. And the minute I did it, the entire branch came crashing down. And that's the experience, uh, the bad decision that I learned. Never trust without checking yourself. Okay, trust but verify. President Reagan said that. Um, another great quote, trust but verify. So why do I bring these up? Because I wanted to talk about today in this session, I have two trace files that I wanted to go over. And um, I think we can get through both. We might get one and a half through, but um, this is about retransmissions. And why do I bring retransmissions? Because I was at a conference and um, I heard somebody raise, and I forget what the conference was. It's like troubleshooting or something or um, new technology. I, I forget. And this lady said this. She stood up and said, are, are retransmissions bad? Um, and so the person gave kind of an academic de you know, definition. Well, packets get lost, and then it gets retransmitted, and that's what a retransmission is. And she goes, and as he's explaining the academic thing of what a retransmission is, she yelled out, and I mean yelled out, these retransmissions are killing me. And we, I had to laugh. I mean, I, I know where she was coming from because uh, retransmission sounds bad, right? Back in the ethernet days, it, collision sounded bad. Collisions weren't bad at all. It's just how the protocol worked. And uh, I even won a bet by saying that I could have a 100% collision rate and my, uh, my throughput would be impacted by maybe five, six percentage point. That's it. Uh, and I proved it. So, you know, when we first start out and open up a trace file, we look at these retransmissions and we think that's bad. And it was back in the days, it was bad. But then with modern stack, it's not that bad. It's just kind of, eh, it's a fast retransmission. And when there's a fast retransmission, I don't know that it would be human perceivable slowness because how fast retransmissions work. And I'm sure there are many other sessions by Chris Greer and others and Jasper and Christian and others, uh, Betty, um, who have presented on how uh, selective acknowledgements work in conjunction with fast retransmission to make packet loss kind of a eh, whatever. But there are ones that are very, very deadly. Okay, This is where a retransmission timeout occurs, meaning fast retransmission didn't detect it and retransmit immediately. You're just kind of having to wait wait it out, wait until your clock expires. Um, and then you go, well, I positively know there was a packet loss and now I'm gonna have to start over. So even there, the newer stacks aren't as brain dead as the oldest stacks where you go crash all the way to the zero and you start slow start from one packet, two packet, four packet, you know, and then you kind of build that slow start that we are heard about. The newer congestion algorithms, they're much more aggressive than that. So you might even say that, well, maybe retransmission timeouts are not as deadly, but still they're very, very expensive proposition. Okay. Um, so that's why I wanted to kind of focus on um, retransmission and I think he, yep. So here, the point here is that uh, retransmissions really will kill you. Okay. Now, one other thing, um, I'm going to not go to presenter mode here. I'm going to go to just a regular mode. When you're troubleshooting and looking at trace files, make sure you're situationally aware. Okay, You have to have situational awareness about in what direction or which side are you closer to? Are you closer to the transmitter or are you... And let me group this guys here. Or are you closer to the server? Because when one of these packets go missing, it looks very different. Retransmission versus out of order, um, spurious uh, retransmission you might have seen, et cetera. So depending on which side you're on, 
the view and the troubleshooting scenario will look very different. Okay, so this is very important that you try to figure out, am I capturing from the left side by the user or am I capturing somewhere in the network or am I capturing on the server itself? And there are tips and tricks uh, over time you can learn uh, on how to figure that out. And we'll do some of that today as well, okay? All right, so I think that's it. We're going to go to uh, screen share. So I'm going to stop sharing my desk and I'm gonna share my um, trace file. And give me a second. Okay, all right. So you should be able to see my um, screen, uh, Wireshark, Sharkfest, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, my Wireshark screen. And if someone can tell me in the chat that they can see it, that'd be great. All right, and while I'm here, um, thank you, David. Oh, David, uh, good to see you. So there was a question here, what could be the cause of retransmissions on the network? Simple, packet loss. So why do packet loss happen? Well, there's a buffer overrun. Uh, switches and uh, routers, as, as good as they are, as fast as they are, they have a finite uh, space. The other thing is, think about how, you know, Verizon talks about fiber to the, every desktop, every home, which is kind of meaningless because it's not like you have a gigabit all the way to wherever you want to go, right? So even a Verizon head end will have a shared service, shared circuit for however many homes there are. I have a gigabit service. I love it. But I know that I don't have gigabit service end to end to every server, every website that I want to go to. There, at some point, there's a shared pipe, 100 terabits, uh, terabit, 10 gigabit, et cetera. So you can have, um, think of it as 10 lanes going to four lanes, going to two lanes. At some point that happens and congestion occurs and packets get dropped. Okay. And then the other one is not as much, but this was more common. Your infrastructure, your cabling plant, your physical cable plant, not good. All right. Um, and this was more, you know, it happened before when we were using Cat3 cables uh, and coax cables with taps and whatnot. And if we were in real shark fest, I can tell you some very funny stories about how uh, thick net and thin net used to wreak havoc to the network. But uh, with the modern Cat5e, Cat6, even Cat5, um, you're not going to get much electrical or interference uh, from the actual cable plant itself. Okay. All right, so with that, let's go and look at this um, trace file. So this says, we see here since SYNAC Act, and then right off the bat, we have a TCP out of order. Like what the hell? This is since SYNAC Act, the three-way handshake, and we already have out of order. What's going on? Well, we're gonna find out. And then I scroll down as is my workflow and everything looks okay. But here I see a bunch of retransmissions. So that's no bueno, okay? and. This pattern kind of repeats itself, so I kind of chopped it off. Excuse me, while I get a sip of water. And so let's look at what all of this TCP retransmissions are about. And, and you might think, ah, I know what this is. This is retransmission, no big deal, pack a loss, move on, nothing interesting here. But again, it's one of those things that the deeper you go, the more interesting things you see. And um, I'm pretty sure that you'll learn something new, um, even if you're very good at this, okay? How can I be so sure? Because I learned something new like 40 minutes ago while I was preparing this session. I learned that, um, and this has nothing to do with the troubleshooting or just how to use Wireshark. If you double click in the middle pane here, so this is the hex, I double clicked and on ethernet, you saw me do that and opened up. Wherever you go, that ethernet opens up automatically. But if you double click on it and if you close it, they're all closed, okay? It was driving me nuts because at one point I actually opened up one of these ethernet, but notice what happens is um, it, I actually double clicked on it and then it opened and I could and I had to go to every one of these and I would collapse it, go to this one and collapse it. Um, so if you double click, it globally opens and closes the uh, collapses the the protocol header. Didn't know that. I learned that after using Wireshark for however many years. That's how I know you're going to learn something today. All right. So you can see here that we're using, I have some columns here. 
Uh, again, in my playlist, you can see how I created, created these columns. There are many, many videos on how to create these columns. So I'm not going to uh, delve into that because we do have three or four sharks for this session. In one of my playlists, I have uh, how do you set up Wireshark for troubleshooting, something like that, that walks you through all these different profiles. And um, in one of those plays, there's a, a link you can get from Dropbox, I believe, box, where you can download these uh, profiles that I use. All right, different people use different profiles, so it may not be very interesting to you. So 192.168 is sending us in. We can see some of the, it's a modern stack because it has ex explicit congestion notification. Uh, and then you see the SYNAC, and that took about 31 milliseconds because I have a delta here, nothing extraordinary until we go, wait a minute, how is this out of order? And it's just a SYNAC, how can this be out of order? Why is, why is it telling me, um, and why do I have this guy and this guy, packet two and three, be um, a retransmission? Not a re well, is it a retransmission? Because it's the same packet, right? Now, there are a couple of things that we can do to look at to see if it's same packet or not, right? We all know that IP ID, while we still have it, because um, IPv6 doesn't, uh, maybe we can use this. And this is not a surefire thing either. But here in this case, this guy and this guy, packet two, packet three, which are both SYNAC, are not in the same IP ID. So it doesn't look like this is one of those cases where there was a router on a stick and the packet went up and came back down and we captured it twice as it changed the VLANs, for example. Okay, And um, because here in the Ethernet section, you, you would have seen VLAN tags there as well. Okay, so what the hell is going on? Why did this happen? And what's different about this guy and this guy? Okay, so one trick that I use is if I hover over the TCP, so I just single clicked on the TCP protocol. I do this quite often, this trick. You can see all the hex here. And then as you notice that as you highlight over each one down here, it tells you which byte it is and what it is. Okay, so this one is source port, byte offset 3435, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you just click on it here, you can see that the whole thing is highlighted down here. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go click here and here, packet two and three, and you'll notice when you look at your, you kind of, you, you can do this in a peripheral vision. It's even better if you use your peripheral vision. Nothing changes in that highlighted blue. I'm going back and forth, back and forth, up, down, up, down. You can also use F7, F8 um, function key, because I think that was uh, the old DOS sniffer um, leftover. But you can use up and down arrow key. Nothing changes in that blue, which means from a TCP header, I don't have to individually look for sequence numbers and um, you know TCP options and whatnot. I can just go back and forth real quick. Nothing is changing on the blue and therefore I'm good to go. So what about IP header? Well, we already know that IP ID is different. So there's gonna be some change there. But again, if I do that, there's actually more change that I anticipate because you can see, I'm, I'll keep doing this. Take a look at that blue block and you'll see whether you use the hexadecimal or not, or the, the actual raw bit count on the right, you can see where things are changing back and forth, back and forth, okay? Why is that? Well, let's take a look. So it's one of these guys down here, on the, I'm sorry, on the uh, IP. And so packet number two, um, it changed over here. And you can see here, well, CS is zero, that's weird. Um, so DSCP is a quality of service. You can set it for whatever you want, quite honestly, but there are well-known standards, okay? AF for video, EF for voice. Uh, most default traffic have zero as DSCP. This is for control. CS6 for router-to-router -router communication. In some industry standards. They're not written in stone. You can change them to be whatever you want. The next, so packet number three has CS0. Packet number two is also CS0, okay? Here, packet number... Oh, this is also CS0. Okay, so that's weird. Um, how about if I come down here? Okay. So they are all CS0s, which is weird. 
Okay, it's not illegal, but it's weird. Um, should be using CS0 there. So come back up to here and packet one in here and here. And you see this is changing here. Okay, also on the ECN side of the house, it's changing. Okay, um, of course, the IP IDs. And then what happens is uh, TCP resets and says, I I'm so confused. You're sending me two Sin Synax. Um, they're, they both obviously got to the other guy and uh, the guy that sent the Sin is like, why are you sending me two Synax? I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna reset the connection. And then immediately we have the Sin again, okay? And so this is the uh, a new TCP. Again, the TCP port number was reused. So I'm not gonna go into the finite state machine for TCP or IP. Uh, but anyway, the port number is reused. We see that it's a brand new SYN. And then this um, look, and then it would come down to here. Uh, we see SYNAC and then we see ACK. So this is normal through a handshake. Okay, got it. Everything is fine. Um, let's see what else. Um, packet number five and six. Um, that all, so we now know Okay, so I'm going to put control T here, which is a time reference. Control T is um, a good shortcut because it resets the time reference. So that start of the uh, beginning of trace is the time column. Delta is delta from the previous packet. So it's nice to know that, hey, this is 31 milliseconds from here to here. And um, the delta from here to here is uh, 38 microseconds. So where are we? Well, we don't know when we saw this packet. Okay, but we do know that this 10 dot, we saw 31 milliseconds into it. And then immediately we saw 192.1 respond. So that means we're closer to 192.168.1.1, right? All right. Um, okay, uh, let's see, what else? Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, oh yeah, the other thing we can do, um, how, how do we tell if we're capturing from the machine itself um, or is there some other tips and tricks that we can use? And there is. We can actually use the length field. Jasper had a good uh, tips and tricks on how to use this length field to know if you're capturing on the inside of the machine or if you're capturing externally. Another thing that you can use is uh, Ethernet addresses because often you'll see a source IP address. It'll say like Dell or Broadcom, um, you know, the usuals. And more often than not, the next MAC address will be Juniper, Cisco, um, Palo Alto, right? Because these are vendor OUIs, vendor assigned MAC addresses. And so you know that you're talking to an infrastructure or it could be server to server in, in direct, if, if it's in the same layer too, you would see the other server's MAC address. That kind of seems like that's what's happening here, right? Look at that uh, Ethernet MAC address, which is F25D, okay? And if you're thinking, well, that FD looks kind of weird, you'd be right. It's, it's unusual to see a character like F2 be the first uh, source or destination MAC address. In this case, they're both F2, F2. And why is that significant? Um, and that's a little joke. You'll, you'll see it in a second. So the reason why that's significant is because of this rule, okay? So here's the MAC address. Ethernet transmits, it's LSB, okay? Least significant bit first. What does that mean? So, you know, there's a concept of little NDN, big NDN. So when Ethernet transmits, F2, the first byte F2 is transmitted first, okay? But at the bit level, this F2, which is down here, is in binary, F2 looks like this. Okay, this is, I mean, obviously, right? One F is hexadecimal, one, 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 we get it. Zero, zero, one, zero is two, we get it. We don't need to be uh, mathematical geniuses to figure that out in our head. What's important is that the first bit, remember, it's the least significant bit. That's how ethernet works. In the old days, when you opened up or, or loaded up drivers, you saw things like LSB show up, okay? And when you uh, installed your drivers, LSB stands for least significant bit. So the first one here is, uh, and actually I have the, Carl has it right. It's uh, globally, uh, globally addressed or multicast, okay? So that's zero or one. 
It's not. So you might be thinking, oh yeah, this is broadcast because the one here is it's one. It's not, that's the most significant bit. The least significant bit is here. Okay, so that's zero. So we know that this is a unicast. What's the second bit? The second bit is called locally administer address, LAA. What this means is someone told the driver to make up a MAC address, and this is not one of the OUI registered hardware MAC address. Someone software-wise created this MAC address. So chances are we could be working, looking at a hypervisor because it's not a physical MAC address. Is that always the case? It's not. Uh, it's just one of those things that you can put into your toolkit to look at um, whether that's software driven or not, okay? But even, you know, $50 Linksys can do MAC cloning for uh, showing a, a consistent MAC address on the outside, and they'll override that locally administered address bit to back to zero, so people wouldn't know, okay? So it's not a hard and fast rule, but for most Ethernet drivers, when you make up an IP uh, Ethernet address, MAC address, this bit gets set. So we know that there's hypervisor involved here, um, probably. All right, so moving on, take a sip of water. All right, so let's take a look at um, packet 58 because that's when something exciting happens, right? So there's a lot of pushes. The push bit means that there's an application saying, hey, I need you to do this for me. Um, and the other guy says, okay, I got that. And um, so every time there's a push, think of that as a period of an end of a sentence and everybody exchanges sentences back and forth. So when I finish my sentence, I wait. Um, you tell me something. I wait and you tell me something, et cetera. Okay, so push means kind of the application's way of saying, uh, I wanna say something and then until I'm done, don't respond to me, okay? Logic application to application wise. So we know that this is very chatty because there's a constant change of IP addresses, a lot of push ads. And uh, the more pushes you see, the more chatty the application, which means the more sensitive it is to latency. But here, we're not worried about latency yet. And we're worried about this glob of retransmissions that happens, okay? So let's delve into this a little bit closer to see what it is that's happening, okay? So at packet 58, I'm gonna start from here because everything else before this is normal except for that Cincinnati weirdness, um, which I don't know why it did that, but here we are at, um, so this is 10 dot sending 14 bytes of data to the other side. There's nothing unusual about this. It's just um, 10, source 10 sending to client 192.168. Hey, here's 14 bytes of data. Um, and you can see here 890 to 904. And the, the next client here says, okay, um, I'm going to acknowledge you. Um, you can see 904, okay? From a UI perspective, you see this check mark here. That just means that this is in response to this. Next expected sequence number 904, acknowledgement 904. Again, I'm not going over what next expected sequence number and acknowledgement means. Again, this is a three, four fin session. So you should already know what that implies. But this is basically saying, I'm gonna send you up to 904 bytes. And the acknowledgement is saying, I got you up to 904 bytes. But what's the time difference between this guy and this guy? 20 milliseconds. So you might be thinking, or you should be thinking, wait a minute. How can that 192.168 acknowledge me in 20 milliseconds when we know that there's Nagel and delayed acknowledgement? Okay, Nagel says, don't transmit unless there's a full size, uh, full MSS packet. Delayed acknowledgement says, don't acknowledge it unless you get either two full size or two packets of any size for Windows. And yet this guy is sending every something at 20 milliseconds. How can that be? Maybe, maybe they crank down the delayed acknowledgement to be 20 milliseconds or so, so that they can break that deadlock, maybe. But again, this is that other phrase that I use when you hear hooves beating, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, hooves beating, think horses, not zebras. Um, so it could be that they crank down the delayed acknowledgement, but in reality, this guy has length. This is a piggyback act, okay? Normally, if 192.168 didn't have something to send, 
he would have to wait. He, he wouldn't be able to acknowledge this packet right away because it's a small packet and it's a single one. So delayed act says, no, nope, no, nope, under no circumstances can you respond to this with an acknowledgement because A, I don't have two packets for Windows or two full MSS packets for Linux or Unix uh, or any other operating system. And, um, but since 192 had something to send anyway, it sent it, okay? So another mystery solved, perfect. Um, what else? Um, okay, so if we look at here, this guy, packet number 60, looks similar, doesn't it? We've seen this before, 890 to 904, um, 14 bytes from 10 to one. Where do we see this? And, and Wireshark is saying, hey, this is a spurious retransmission. So why is it a spurious retransmission? Because from Wireshark's perspective, it saw this acknowledgement and it's seeing yet another acknowledgement. So he's saying, hey, uh, you should have seen this because we already sent an acknowledgement and we're seeing it again, okay? Fair enough. But again, this is where situational awareness comes into play, okay? So let's, let's take a look and see what's going on here. Some of the things that you should always do when you're troubleshooting is to wrap your head around, am I closer to 192.168 or am I close to 10? I think we said that we're closer to 192.168. So this guy sent the packet. So I'm gonna set this guy uh, as a time reference. It's just easier not having to deal with these 4.39 numbers. So I'm gonna just highlight that control T it. So now that's my beginning of my universe. That's my big bang, okay? So with, it's much easier to say, okay, in 20 milliseconds, uh, the client 192.168 sent something. And then in the back of your mind, you think, well, why the hell did 192.168 take so long to respond 20 milliseconds when I know I'm closer to 192.168? We've already established that. So as soon as it saw this, why, didn't, why did it wait 20 milliseconds? Well, because this is an application data. The application had to do something. Um, and it's because, again, so let me compare and contrast that with the sin SYNAC, okay? So SYN, um, SYNAC is, let's see. So this is a SYN. SYNAC from 192.168 happened in 38 microseconds. So we're super close to 192.168. But here, uh, it took 20 milliseconds, again, because the application delay. These are all the things that you have to be thinking as a troubleshooter. So I'm just basically thinking out loud what I normally do in my head, okay? That's why if it, this session sounds very confusing, it's because I'm trying to explain to you what goes in my head. I'm asking all these questions because they're all relevant. As a troubleshooter, you need to know the protocol well enough to ask and answer all these questions and start ruling them out as not interesting, not interesting, not interesting. So this 20 millisecond delay, application delay, not interesting other than, hey, your application took 20 milliseconds to uh, respond. Okay, no big deal. Then look at this guy. Why is this significant? So this is that uh, acknowledgement that we saw yet again. We saw it twice. Why did we see it twice? And do we have any clues here on why we might have seen that twice? So here's the first one, 14 bytes. And here is the second one, 14 bytes. Clearly different packets. It's, look at the time. Okay, look at the delta time or from the beginning to end. Okay, so Juan is right. It took over 200 milliseconds. So. Take your situational awareness and, go, and put your brain, the view, to the receiver or the sender. Okay, so let's kind of shift our lens to the sender. I sent you something. I'm waiting for an acknowledgement. And from my perspective at 192.168, I acknowledged you. It's right here. Proof is in the pudding. I acknowledge you for 904, packet, uh, byte number one, act number 904. Next expected sequence number, I did my job, I'm good. Yet 200 milliseconds later, you sent me another 14 bytes and that's a retransmission. Not just a regular retransmission, but the deadly one. This is a retransmission timeout. Packet was completely lost and so he's retransmitting. 
But how can the packet be lost when it can't? We saw it twice. So clearly the packet wasn't lost. What the hell's going on? Again, you have to be situationally aware. What this is saying isn't that these packets got lost. Clearly it didn't because we see it in the trace file. What got lost was the acknowledgement. Okay. So remember, TCP is a two way conversation. And that's why it's always um, difficult when you first start out because you have to think both direction, the th two different sequence numbers, two different act numbers, and it's very easy to get wrapped around the axle. So don't try to think, dice the, slice and dice the problem from only the sender to the receiver. So when you're doing that analysis, just look at the sequence number of the sender and just look at the acknowledgement number from the receiver. Mentally throw out the sequence number that the receiver is sending because it's not important right now, okay? And you can see that, okay, so if we assume that this got lost, it makes sense that this packet would get retransmitted. Not only that, but there's a giant clue here because a lot of times 200 milliseconds is um, what it takes, okay? 200 milliseconds is a reasonable retransmission timeout. 250 milliseconds is another one. 150 to 75, I've seen 75. Again, no hard and fast rules, but it's um, we can reasonably conclude that that's what happened. All right, so why did this packet get lost? Because everything was fine here. What's so special about this guy? Well, we have another giant clue, okay, as to why this packet was lost, okay? And again, because your eyes, you should be training your eyes to look at these things uh, on the screen. This is why the setup of Wireshark is so important because if I'm using someone else's layout, I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to pick this out instantaneously like I would because I'm used to my screen, my format. And that is 7160. And you might say, well, I know what that is. That's a TCP offload. Right? We, when you do TCP offload and you're capturing at the host, the TCP, the segmentation of that data, the quantizing of that data happens below you. So you see this giant, or maybe not. Maybe this is a real jumbo frame, okay? Um, and you think, well, jumbo frames are supposed to be 9,000 uh, bytes, but maybe the application only had 7,000 to send. Okay. In this case, this was a jumbo enabled network. So physically sending 7160 is perfectly legit. Or is it? Because we have some more clues here. All right. So the 7160 packet sequence numbers, now we're looking at the sequence number of 192.168. Uh, so we kind of, again, we flipped it. So we're not looking at the sequence number of uh, 10. Um, 192, I'm looking at the, I'm sorry, the 10 dot guy, I'm looking at the sequence number of 192.168. So remember, we did a situational awareness flip to 180. So 192.168 says, hey, I got 7,000 bytes to send to you. And the other guy's like, hey, uh, I sent you some packets before you still haven't heard. And what happens here? Okay, 192.168 does what? He acknowledges 904 yet again. He's saying, um, I know what's going on. I'm telling you I'm good till 9.04, okay? And then sometime later, this happens, okay? So what the hell just happened here? So let's kind of walk through that one more time. I sent you 7,000 bytes. The other guy says, hey, uh, I'm sending you these 14 bytes again, okay? So Mir, the other guy sent it to me. And I said, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I got that. I got it again. And I'm telling you, I got it again. Okay, that's all that's happening here. Then somehow, magically, 192.168.1.1 sends, look at the sequence number here, 3187, 3187. But the next expected sequence number is 10,347 because it sent 7,000 or so bytes here. Here, we're starting at 3187 and I'm going to 4619. Okay. So how did this 192168 guy know to chop it down to 1432, a reasonable MSS? The most likely reason is that an ICMP type three code four message came saying, hey, packet too large, 
you have a do not fragment bit set. I can't fragment this. So I'm going to throw this away. I need you to crank it down. Uh, and the next maximum, next top max MSS is 1432. Please use that. Why don't we see that in the trace file? Because it was probably filtered when they were capturing it. So I always tell people when you're capturing, you can try to limit to the other conversation because there may be too much going on. Okay. You may not have the luxury of having an isolated test environment. So it's okay to say, uh, capture everything that I'm talking to the 10 dot. If I'm capturing for 18168, capture going to and from 10 dot, 10 dot, 10 dot one, but also put or ICMP or DNS, because those are two troubleshooting things that uh, you have to uh, account a company or account for. Okay. And remember the ICMP type three code four doesn't come from the other side. It comes from some random router along the way telling you to crank it down. We're all good there, right? So then why does this happen? So I'm going to change this to time reference here. So this is the magical moment when I realize, oh, you want me to chop it up smaller. Okay, no problem. I sent this packet. Remember, we're closer to 190 to 168, if not on 190 to 168. We're very close to it. We're 30 microseconds away. And he said 1432. But he's not sending anything else. Why is he not sending? Because his TCP, the other guy's TCP window size, the 10.192 window size is plenty. Okay. The 192, 168 guy is like, bring it on. Give me 200,000 by 262,000 bytes. I'm good. My receive window is fine. So it's not a TCP window problem. So why is this guy sending 1432 and then just sitting there for half a second? Think about that. Why? Could it be slow start? Because the whole purpose of slow start is I have a retransmission timeout happen. I sent this, nothing happened. I didn't hear anything back. Clearly the packet's lost. And the old congestion says, hey, simmer down. By the way, the congestion doesn't tell you to reduce the size. That's ICMP type three code four that sent the 14, um, said crank this down to 1432. That's the most reasonable answer, uh, thing that we can conclude. And then slow start says, send one. If you, you're good with that, send two. If you're good with that, keep ratcheting it up. So this is an older congestion control algorithm TCP. Reasonably, we can conclude that, okay? Because what would have happened is you would have seen 3187 to 4619, then another 1432, then another 1432, then another 1432, another 1432. You would see a big packet train leave kind of like this, okay? Remember this here? So let's imagine this packet's here. Oops, I deleted the wrong thing. I think that's the one. Okay, so imagine these are 1432. The, the guy's window said, hey, I can handle up to 200,000 bytes. So you would have seen up to 200,000 worth of bytes packets flying out from the 192.168 guy, but we don't see that. Essentially what we see is just that 100 go and then he sits tight and waits, okay? And the reason why he's doing that is could be uh, because slow start. The problem is he doesn't hear anything. So what does he do? He backs off. And then he backs off half a second, a full second, about one and a half, close to plus or minus, about three, again, doubling, again, doubling, again, doubling, again, doubling. Okay. And in the meantime, the 10 dot guy is like, hey, what's going on? I got something to send to you. Okay. What this means is that you have a unidirectional blockage here, okay? And yes, exactly right. The delta time keeps doubling. That tells you that's a clue that this is a complete blockage. Right here is when you stop and say, hey, infrastructure, routers, switches, firewalls, um, IPS maybe, um, probably not because nobody uses it as an IPS. They all use it as an IDS. Um, it could be something else, right? Anything that a proxy is a good example. Uh, it could be a steelhead. It could be something else, something that touches the packet. There is a complete blockage and it's unidirectional because while this was happening, the other guy was able to send these packets to us, okay? Complete blockage from 182.168 to 10. 
And then you have a non-blockage from 10 dot to 10 dot. Does that make sense? So stop troubleshooting. You can't solve anything with your trace file anymore. You have to figure out where that blockage occurred and why did it um, cause unidirectional failure, which is unusual, right? If you're jumbo frame enabled, you should send it, okay? What's, so keep in mind that unidirectional failures are very, very rare events. Um, and this was a line card firmware issue that saw a jumbo frame freaked out and lost its mind, but in that, at that inbound buffer. The other direction, the switch was like, I don't care, but you sending me traffic to me, I lost my mind, 7,000, what the hell is this? Uh, and just stop receiving traffic inbound, but it was still able to send it outbound. Okay, does that make sense? All right, um, with that, let's go to the next trace file. See, again, if this was a live session, we could ask a lot more question uh, back and forth. And, um, oh yeah, so why was the MTU changing after since SYNAC was established? Um, so that's a question from John, right? So as you know, when you send a SYN SYNAC, one of the things that happens is, hey, my maximum segment size is 1460, 1432, et cetera. It only happens at SYN SYNAC, okay? But that's actually a lie. <laughs> If that's not the only time that happens because that's the whole reason, raison d'etre, is that the French reason, uh, reason, the reason why it exists, right? Is ICMP type three code four that says, any router along the path can say, hmm, uh, you sent me a packet, it's 7,000, 7, but my next top interface, I know the MSS, MTU, okay? And so it's 1500. So I'm gonna deduct 20 bytes for IP, 20 bytes for TCP header, or maybe more if you have TCP options. And then I'm going to tell you, the sender, to adjust your MSS to 1432. Okay, So it's not only the SYN SYNAC that sees the MT, uh, MTU MSS size. Um, SYNAC and ACK is MSS size. ICMP type 3 code 4 sends you MTU, and you can derive the MSS there and says, hey, to make the next packet, the largest packet that you should send me is 1432. Okay. And Interestingly enough, what happens at the operating system level is that it creates a host route for that destination. And in the routing table, it reduces the MSS. Uh, that's how the host, the OS, knows that when it's talking to that guy, it's to use a different MSS than everybody else. Okay, it creates a host route. That's how it keeps everything together. All right. Um, so hopefully, as you uh, look at these trace files, you guys are kind of picking up on some of the things that you should be talking to yourself about and uh, things to look for so that you can pick up on these clues, because it's very rare that you have a smoking gun when you're doing protocol analysis. It's very rare. Um, it feels great when that happens, but it's very rare. All right. Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to switch gears. So you can, this was a um, throughput issue from, uh, I believe it was uh, overseas to London, if I remember right. And it doesn't matter what the application is. It was just horrible, horrible throughput. And uh, someone sent it to me and said, hey, can you make heads or tails out of it? And um, so I did. I said, well, I, I, I don't know what the application is. I don't have a whole lot of information, but I'll take a quick look and give you kind of a diagnosis of what I think may be happening. And unfortunately, this is another uh, serious um, deep dive, but I'll try to highlight the key points so we can spend time on the Q&A, okay? And <laughs> David, <laughs> sharks chewing on the, the cables again. That's awesome. Um, by the way, uh, a slight, slight detour. If you ever read the book, Blind Men's Bluff, this is about submarine warfare in the 50s, 60s, 70s. They talk about how this, um, the U.S. So, uh, submarine, special built submarine, went to Russia and, and put out a box that tapped into uh, the phone lines that Russians were using, uh, Soviets, I should say, because it was still Soviet Union back then. And they were able to tap in without, not a vampire tap or physical tap, electrically uh, pick up the signals and listen in on that conversation. So it's not the sharks chewing it, but maybe it was a submarine 
um, chewing on these cables. <laughs> but uh, okay, so the other one here, so let's go back to this trace file. Some things that throw it out of your brain, the sequence number not being a um, relative, that happens when you anonymize packets. And this wasn't done, this was done first with uh, BitTwisty, which was an older tool. And, uh, and then thank goodness Jasper wrote the um, Trace Wrangler. So if you haven't heard about Trace Wrangler, look it up, Google it. It's a, it's a terrific tool that chops up and anonymizes your packet in a much better way than BitTwisty used to do. So if I just scroll down, um, we see that um, there's a pattern here, okay? And you should be able to see the pattern until we got to here. So let me scroll back up. Okay, I'm gonna just scroll down. Just kind of just observe it, okay? Again, this is why 10,000 hours of practice is required because your brain needs to be able to process these things happening. So there's a regularity to this problem, okay? There's a big block of it, but here there's a regularity to this spurious transmission, okay? And, and I'm not even trying to read it. I'm just actually seeing the little lines go, bzz, bzz. see how the brackets here and the numbers? When I scroll down, you can see that brackets very, very quickly. Your eyes are very good at picking that up, especially if you use kind of peripheral vision because peripheral vision, because of the rods and cones are better at picking up fast moving things, okay? So there is clearly periodic thing happening here, which is good because that means it's easier to troubleshoot. When it's happening, uh, routinely, then you, you have a better chance of it happening than just randomly. So what are some of the thoughts here? Okay, so if we put on our thinking cap, we see that there's a, you know, spurious retransmission, again, because spurious, because we saw it and, and um, Wireshark's like, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. I saw it, so why is it a retransmission? We see the duplicate act, okay, and then we see duplicate act, and then it seems to go on and then it happens again, seems to go on, happens again, seems to go on, happens again. There's no reset here. So we're crawling along with these periodic retransmissions. What would cause something like that with that periodicity? Okay, well, maybe there's a multi-path going on and one of those paths is wrong. So there's four equi distant or four egress from this guy that's sending uh, the traffic to us, 192 is sending it to uh, 10 dot, I guess. And that's why one of those cables is bad, but that's certainly a possibility. And when you're doing routers and switches, um, now they're almost synonymous, but back in the days, you can actually say, you know, do per packet load balancing. That could be it. Probably not though, because if it was per packet load balancing, and you assume they have four paths or even eight paths, then every eight packets would be uh, lost like clockwork. That doesn't seem to be the case here. So that's probably not it. What else? It's not solar flares because there's too much regularity, periodicity to this problem, okay? So it's probably something else, but something else should have caught your eye. So let's kind of go back. Some of those deltas are pretty big, aren't they? Okay. When you're scrolling and you see these big deltas, it could be because they're far away, makes perfect sense, but maybe it's not. Okay. So let's take a look at um, this guy here. One second. Okay. Let's start at packet number 12. So this is guy saying, hey, I'm sending you 371 bytes of data. One to 372, perfect, okay, that's easy. So, but it's also not a full size. So in the back of your mind, you think, okay, this could be subject to delayed acknowledgement, right? Because the other guys, um, that's the only thing that he sent. So it may be subject to delayed acknowledgement, not responding in time, okay? So certainly that's, that's true. And then here we see another 216 bytes of data. So this guy, remember we flipped the, I sent a one, or 10.sent to 192168, 371 bytes of data, but now 192.168 is sending that data, okay? Again, acknowledging within 142 milliseconds, again, we're pretty far apart, um, and it's not delayed acknowledgement because he's got something to send. So again, this is piggyback act as well, okay? Um, but even though this is a 216 byte, 
He doesn't slow down at all because within three hundred three mi three milliseconds. So let's actually put the time reference here. Within uh, three micro three milliseconds, he sends uh, 1460 bytes, 1460 bytes, 1460 bytes, and then 90 bytes. Okay, that's a little odd. Why is that odd? Because if you add up that number, it's not 4096. It's 4,776 bytes. I say it's odd because a lot of applications work in two to the four, you know, uh, exponents of two. So they either send 1024, 2048, uh, 4096, you know, those boundary numbers. So sending 4776 seems kind of odd, but we also have another hint, which is you should look at, which is that the push bit was set. Whenever a push bit, remember I said that's like end of your sentence. So he's, he, this 10.192.168 is starting to starting the conversation with 216 bytes something, and he's spewing these packets. Um, and when he's done, he has a push bit there saying, okay, I'm done. Uh, I'm going to sit back and wait for you to acknowledge me. And sure enough, uh, packet 18 here says, okay, I'm acknowledging 46.93. Wait, what? How could he be acknowledging 45 or 4693? Next, next sequence number 4693. What the hell is that about? So I'm going to come here, take the time off, time reference off. And this is um, acknowledgement 4693. Okay. Where's 4693? Way up here. Okay. Because this is my sequence number, next expected sequence number 4693. I'm acknowledging 4693. But I'm also, this is also retransmission because this is at 371 byte. This packet here, 192.168, is acknowledging packet number 18. Okay, why is that weird? So 10 dot sent something to me, um, one through one 372. And I said, yep, yeah, good for 372. And why is that interesting? because it's a dupe back. It's saying that it's a duplicate acknowledgement, okay? And, ah, oh, crap, time's up. All right, so, um, so if we do, let me kind of get cut to the chase. There's actually a lot of stuff here happening. I may make this a separate video because this is actually very, very interesting and a very, very deep dive. Um, but we have um, Q&A coming up, which is also important. So I wanna show you guys one thing is if I go from spurious transmission to spurious transmission, look what happens, control T. Okay, so this is my first spurious transmission. There's a 255 millisecond delay here and to here is 500 milliseconds. Okay, so, and this is very repeatable. Spurious retransmission to retransmission is 500 milliseconds. There's probably 250, 270 actual round trip um, so what happens when you have an over 200 millisecond in-flight time, okay? Think about that. If you're using uh, flight time, so in your mind, start sending packets out. You're the sender, okay? And you start sending packets, as many as you want until you're authorized. In fact, let's do this. We'll use this as example again, okay? So let's say this user starts spewing packets to the server, okay? And this duration from here to here is over 200 milliseconds. More than that, it's 270 or something like that, okay? What do you think is going to happen? The user is sitting here. He sent out, well, let's make it easier and say that he sent these four packets out, okay? And he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting. So when these guys are all traversing from here, okay? So this is, I guess this is like ghetto PowerPoint animation, manual animation. So he's flying, okay? And I started the clocks. The minute I sent out the first 100 byte packet, actually this is surprisingly useful. Um, so I'm flying, 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 flying. Right about here, 200 millisecond timer has expired. What do you think this guy is going to do? He's going to say, hey, there was a massive packet loss. I'm going to retransmit 
not everything because I experienced a retransmission timeout. So I'm going to send, according to the rules of congestion avoidance, I'm going to send one packet. By then, these packets were not lost. So they arrived here to the server. And at some point, this little straggler guy comes running in again and the server says, hey, that's a spurious retransmission. Why are you sending me that when I already got it here? Because from the sender's perspective, 200 millisecond retransmission happens. He has to start over. He keeps draining this pipe and this cycle repeats itself again and again and again. Okay, so this was nothing more than an old stack or a broken stack that didn't account for the physical distance. So this spurious retransmission happened again and again and again. Okay, hope that was, I know I kind of cut to the chase there at the end, but there's actually more interesting things about this trace file that led me to this conclusion. Um, so I may actually make a, um, a video of that. Okay, and for those of you that started to watch my TCP basics, uh, it's been over a year now, Lot, lots happens in a year. To to uh, um, to say the least. Um, so I'll stop sharing here, and I think I'm back on video. So uh, I'm going to start making TCP analysis videos again. I'm going to make some woodworking videos again. Um, the first video that I'm going to make is how to terminate patch cables. Um, a lot of people know how to do it, but they don't know the tips and tricks of how to make your life easier. So I wanted to make uh, a video on how to make ethernet cables, it'll save you a lot of money. Um, but more importantly, the tips and tricks to, uh, there's, there's, again, it takes practice, right? So I wanna impart that practice wisdom on how to make uh, the cables. And then I'll, I got some woodworking videos, some tips and tricks on a DeWalt table saw, but I'm going back to TCP basics as well. So be on the lookout for those. I'm going to open it up for uh, questions right now. Um, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, comment, I appreciate that and going to the details of the last trace. Yeah, absolutely, you'll see that. Now, here's the thing, right? From a YouTube analytics, it sucks because the people who are ardent fans of protocol analysis watch 30, 40 minute videos on a very mundane topic, very academic, very you know dry uh, stuff. But I, I'm actually a little funnier than when I usually present at SharkFest. When I'm doing it live, I'm, I'm funnier without the feedback, without the act for coming from you guys in, in real time. I tend to not get jazzed up about it, but I'll make a video of it and go into the nitty gritty of these trace files because that's how you get good, okay? The other thing is, um, and uh, magnifying glass. So uh, yeah, I made the font size bigger, but if it wasn't big, um, then I'll try to make it bigger uh, on my YouTube videos as big as I can. And um, so I'll take that into consideration as well. And uh, the dad jokes, yes, the dad jokes, um, they're always good. Oh, by the way, talking about dad jokes, what's the one that I heard? Uh, when does a joke become a dad joke? When it becomes a parent, okay? when it becomes a parent, it's a dad joke. Um, so any, um, any other, uh, see, there's a lot of lulls there. It's, it's funny, not all dad jokes are bad. So any other questions, um, I'll, I'll get the contents for sure. I'll do that. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and if you do have questions, uh, I'll be on Discord for a little while. So ask me that. And I, I want to you know, go, go back to my experience as an engineer student. And I, I've said this in the past. When the professor's up there drawing up whatever it was, right? Um, complex variables, Fourier, um, Laplace transformation, whatever it was. You sit back and you go, that's easy. I got it. Oh yeah, of course you do that. I would do that. Who wouldn't do that? And you're, you're sucking it all in. Then you open up your Howard Anton calculus book. I still even remember that author's name because he drove me nuts. You'd open it up and you go, yeah, that all made sense. Then you go, what the hell did he do? Why the hell did he do that? I don't understand what's going on. So it's, it's very easy to listen and observe but it doesn't make that solid connection in your brain. That takes practice. That's why you have to open up a trace file every chance you get and you keep going, going and, and, and just keep plugging away and you're doing multiple things. You're training your eyes to spot patterns. You're training your eyes to see what goes where, where the sequence number is, where the next expected sequence number is, what direction you should be looking at. 
um, what, why you shouldn't believe Wireshark when it tells you something through its analytics because it's not as smart as a good analyst. These are, these are things that can only happen through practice. And the only way you can get practice is by opening trace files and looking at it and watching a lot of SharkFest sessions from all the great presenters that we have at SharkFest and all the usual suspects of presenters here. Look at them, watch them, and get good at it. And don't be afraid to ask questions um, because you know that old adage that you know there are no stupid questions, uh, that's false. There are actually a lot of stupid people asking questions that make it a stupid question. I'm joking. It's a joke. There are no stupid questions because I learned something today about double clicking on that TCP header, okay, in the in the shark in the Wireshark UI. So nobody's too old to learn something new. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy. If you're shy, that's bad on you, and you're gonna miss out because I guarantee you, there's ten other people attending the session going, "What the hell did he just say?" Like, I don't get it, okay? Be, be aggressive and saying, hey, hold on a second, slow down, rewind, and tell me why you said that again, okay? Um, and so, um, so there's a question, how to be a good packet analyst? Uh, so you have to read, you have to read, you have to have the academic foundation. Uh, you know, this adage is so old that it's in the Bible. He who builds his house on sand, guess what? You're screwed, okay? You have to have a bedrock. The only way to have a bedrock is I actually cleaned this desk. Um, if I turn off my filter, you'll see that um, my desk is pretty clean because I cleaned up. But you have to read um, a couple different books. You have to read Tannenbaum Computer Networks. Uh, you have to read Comer, TCP IP Networking, Internet Working with TCP IP by Douglas Comer. That's another classic. Then you have to know Stevens, Volume 1. Uh, you have to know that because Stevens is one of the best books on um, TCP IP. Okay, it's so good that if you read it and you don't really understand it, then that's for you for you to reread that book. And if you still don't get it, time for a career change. Okay, it's that good of a book on explaining how TCP/IP works. TCP uh, uh, Stevens, TCP/IP Illustrated by Stevens. It's an industry bible. Read it, learn it, and then RFCs. You have to read RFCs. It's dry, but you know what? you have to get used to reading RFCs because they all speak the same language. So if you keep reading RFCs, you get the gist of what they're trying to say. However, academic and highbrow and ivory tower they're trying to be, you start to read it. Um, and if you don't believe me, uh, read the RFC on SAC, okay? Selective acknowledgement. And you'll, you'll go, I know how SAC, SAC works, but I don't even know what the hell this RFC is trying to say. Go back, watch some great videos that um, people have presented about selective acknowledgement. I don't know if I, I, I've dealt with selective acknowledgement, I think as a troubleshooting session, but I know Chris Greer has a great session on selective acknowledgement. I think, um, I think Betty had a great session on TC, uh, selective acknowledgement as well. And uh, watch those videos after having read the RFC going, what the hell are they talking about? And then watch that video and go, okay, I think I know what's going on. Then reread the RFC, and then you go, oh, I see. This is what they mean about left edge, right edge. Okay. So if you want to get good, you have to read. You have to read the books. Okay. And um, so um, I think it's Harshal uh, Dewan. Uh, in my in my YouTube playlist, there's a uh, one of the first videos, TCP/IP basics. I actually showed all the books that you should read. Okay, Douglas Comer, Internet Working with TCP/IP. Stevens, TCP IP Illustrated. And then um, if you're a routing and switching guy, you have to read Doyle, routing and switching with Doyle. And then you have to read Halabi's BGP uh, book by Halabi. Um, and th these are, and then the other one is actually a guy named Terry Slattery uh, wrote a TCP IP, uh, routing TCP IP book. Um, and that's just pure routing switching by Terry Slattery, but it's a, Great, great book if you want to get good on routing and switching. Okay. So, um, and I'll do that. So, um, let's see here. I'm going to send you to a link. So, when this gets recorded, I'll type up all those names. Uh, and, and then when this Zoom gets replayed on retrospective page, you will have the books listed here. And I'll give you the titles and authors uh, of everyone that I just spouted off. Okay. Um, okay. And I see some people uh, sending 
um, Stephen's um, PDFs and whatnot. All right, and um, any other questions? So I have five minutes. Uh, I think you're supposed to do a survey. So please do the surveys because if you don't do the surveys, um, I don't know to change my behavior. There was one session I did a couple, and I, I completely changed my format. And it was more about troubleshooting windows and some packet analysis and people hated it. Like, dude, go back to packets. So this time I went more uh, straight to packets. Because again, if that feedback didn't happen, I might still be doing those types of uh, troubleshooting with OS and tools, et cetera, as opposed to just pure packets, okay? So please give me uh, feedback on, and I think, um, yep, Ross, thank you, Ross. Uh, he sent the Google Docs form there, Google Forms link. Please fill that out so we can get better at being presenters at SharkFest. I, I'm so sorry that this is um, this was um, not in person. Oh, I see Blaise right there. Uh, how you doing? Uh, good to see you again, well, virtually. So um, next time, next year, I hope you all, all of you will come back to SharkFest because I'm pretty sure it's going to be in um, in person. I believe it's going to be in Kansas City, but um, I'm not 100% sure. So don't quote me on that. And you'll get to um, enjoy the core developers. You'll get to interact with all the instructors. And I always say this, SharkFest is the only industry conference where people, other instructors sit in on other instructors sessions and they learn. I learned a tremendous amount going to other instructor shark fest sessions that's how good shark fest is so please come back and we'll do it in person and uh, we'll buy each other scotch okay um with that thank you